If you love ancient history, then this is the channel for you. History Hit TV. It's like Netflix, but dedicated just to ad-free history documentaries, including a huge library of ancient history content from the 9th Legion to Boudicca to the First Britain. Simply check out the details in the description below and make sure you use code ODYSSEY on sign up. So there's only one way to figure it all out. Unzip the archaeology. Make it naked. The New Testament story of Jesus' birth has been told thousands of times. Long ago, in Nazareth, there lived a young woman named Mary. One day, an angel appeared and told her she had been chosen to have God's Son. Soon after, Mary and her husband Joseph set off on a difficult journey to Bethlehem. Then, in a stable, Mary gave birth to a bouncing baby boy and put him in a manger full of hay. They were visited by some shepherds, some animals, three wise men, and a couple of angels, too. Every year, billions of people around the world celebrate Jesus' birth. The Bible gives us details of the nativity story, but barely mentions anything about the next 30 years of Jesus' life. These are the lost years. And what he did in his youth is open to a variety of interpretations, which have evolved for over 2,000 years. With archaeology as my guide, I'm going to retrace the footsteps of the young Jesus. I'll go where he went and see what he saw, trying to unravel the truth from tradition. My search begins where it all began, the little town of Bethlehem. This is the traditional place of the birth of Jesus. This is where the manger is supposed to be. And this is where the Magi are supposed to have come. The star led them to this very place, according to Christian lore. This is the traditional Bethlehem, but is it the Bethlehem of archaeology? This is exciting. This is the Church of Nativity. We're talking about a 1,600-year-old church. Now, we could stay in line here, or we could say we're television. We don't have to stay in line. This church, believed to be built on top of the manger where Jesus was born, is one of the oldest in Christendom. From crusader kings to kindergarten classes, millions of people have been coming here for the better part of two millennia. You really got to grab what you can over here because the uh, faithful are stampeding. What? Right now, tourism is down. Imagine what it was like when tourism was out. That's the traditional place of Jesus' birth, right over there. X marks the spot where the virgin birth is supposed to have taken place, according to uh, tradition, and where the gospel story is kind of uh, matched to the archaeology and the tradition that's now some 1,500 years old. So we'll get out of their way. And over there is the manger. This is where supposedly uh, baby Jesus was put in a, a little crib or a trough, right over here. See? Now you notice that there is archaeology here. You could see the stone, the original stone. Traditionally, it's interpreted as being some kind of barn, but you see it's not a barn. It makes sense that this would have been somebody's home. It looks like a basement, really. It's a big grotto. 1,500 years of Christian tradition points to this location as the birthplace of Jesus. It's here that archaeology meets with a biblical account. The story continues with Jesus and his family moving to Nazareth. So I think a trip to his old hometown is in order. Maybe a walk around his old neighborhood will reveal something about Jesus' early life. The Nazareth Historical Village is a living museum situated on the ruins of a first-century farm in present-day Nazareth. 
year, a team of biblical scholars and archaeologists are working together to recreate a village that resembles in every way what archaeology tells us about where Jesus grew up. Shalom, peace upon you all. Here, I meet up with Steve and Claire Fawn, New Testament scholars and experts on first century life. Tell me what this place is about. Well, what we have here is the reconstruction of first century life. As a location, this is only 500 meters away from where Jesus lived. So we know that it existed during the time of Jesus and his family. Is this based on Hollywood's version of what things look like, or is this solid archaeology? We've built these buildings out of the same rock, the same mortar, the same roof beams that would have been used back in the first century. This actually looks ancient, this hole in the ground. What you find here is a drain in which rainwater can come down. You've got the the water coming down here, it's collecting the rainwater, right? Yeah. And it's pouring down there. This is a settling pool, so all the dirt can settle to the bottom before it goes up and into the hole down into the cistern inside the wall there. Take, take us in. As you would in a normal house, you'd be coming into a, a courtyard like this. This is really a normal neat. House. The, you guys are good. The, the story here is, is rebuilding first century life. If you want to understand the Bible or the period, you have to be like a detective going back to the scene. Some of the major archaeologists have come through here, and they have really said, now I finally feel like I'm inside a first century town. It comes alive. Instead of looking at some rocks on the, on, on the floor, you're sitting here, you could just see that second level. Right. Sweetie, come down for dinner. You know, I could just... That's it. It's amazing. I can still hear them arguing after all these years. It's, it's definitely a Jewish home. Yeah. Steve shows me a replica of the type of house Jesus grew up in the carpenter shop where he would have helped his father, and the synagogue where he would have prayed. From this recreated village, we can actually envision the early home life of Jesus. He probably lived like any other boy in first century Galilee. He would have gone to school, hopped around the house, and played with the neighborhood kids. After a whirlwind tour, the only thing I haven't seen is a manger. Steve's wife, Claire, takes over the tour to talk about the nativity scene. So he said, you're, you're better with mangers? Well, I think I'm better with childbirth. This is <laughs> I think that was the implication there. Having you're to you're a scholar as well, right? Yeah, I work in New Testament and teach New Testament courses. When we think of the whole uh, nativity story and yeah. being born in, in a manger, you kind of almost think of a European or American farm where they're being sent off to the barn. Because of Christmas cards and film and media, we have a picture of Mary on a donkey in labor in the pouring rain and Joseph arriving at a strange city and going from door to door, knocking at every hotel and motel. And everyone says, sorry, we're full up and your poor pregnant wife who's in labor can't come in and have a room. <laughs> but if we set all of that aside and we just work with the text of the Bible, first off it says there was this census and they were returning to Bethlehem because it was the ancestral home of Joseph's family. If it's their patriarchal home, that means there's a network of relatives already Everybody's living saying, Hi, there. Hi, how are you, long time? S exactly, it's a patriarchal <laughs> home. And long time no see. It's a huge family occasion. Also though, the house is packed to overflowing because everyone who's part of the family has to come for this particular census. So my understanding of this story then is that because the house was so full, because there was no room in the guest room, when Mary went into labor, the question was, where can she have this baby in peace and quiet with some privacy? And the best suggestion they could come up with room like that. was to empty out the storeroom and lay down fresh hay and give her a little bit of privacy. So this is what it probably looked like. It didn't look like an American barn, right? Claire takes me to a grotto that looks very similar to the basement of the Church of the Nativity. Unlike an American barn, this is actually a basement cave. I think a basement is much more like what we would call it. I'm not a woman, but it, it seems to me that I wouldn't mind giving birth. Yeah, and cozy and private. I'd like a little more light, maybe. Well, here's and a Mary offered her oil lamp, little yeah, area. Yeah, there's a little first right. century type oil lamp. So that lamp. Mary, you know. Yeah, they would have lit it with oil lamps. I like your manger. It's a nice. Thank you. It's a nice manger. <laughs> That's one of those. Things. Claire dispels some commonly held notions of the nativity scene. And it's a good reminder of how a traditional story told over the ages evolves into something very different from the original. So with all that straightened out, I'm heading off to meet with an archaeologist who says the story of the nativity may be right, but the location is all wrong. My next stop is a short drive from Nazareth to the ruins of an ancient town called Bethlehem. It's the little-known Bethlehem of the Galilee, 120 kilometers north of the Judean Bethlehem, where most think Jesus was born. 
Here I'm meeting with archaeologist Aviram Oshri. Oshri thinks everyone's got the wrong Bethlehem, and his proof begins with a large wall surrounding this tiny village. This is Bethlehem of Galilee. This is the Galilean Bethlehem? Yeah. We're coming towards Galilean Bethlehem now. Now what's this? This is the wall. These are big blocks. Mm -hmm. If I would have just been wandering around here, I would have thought that these stones are just some kind of terracing system. But in a minute, I'll show you why it can't be just a simple terrace. Why? Because there is a rampart, a built rampart, leading into the, the city. So it's a real fortification. Yeah. Here we see a rampart, which is connected to the wall. It's built on both sides, and it leads us upwards into the city. Walls and ramparts were the primary defenses of ancient cities. These Byzantine fortifications suggest that a powerful city once stood here. But Bethlehem of the Galilee was a tiny village. What could these later Christians have been protecting? So yeah. this, this is not a small village. It's a small village by size. A small village with a very big fortification. Yeah. Ah. Here you can see the continuation of the wall. Usually you find that kind of walls in uh, big cities like uh, Jerusalem. It's quite unique for a village that small to be fortified. So you're saying the fact that there is such a significant wall for what otherwise would be a small little village must mean that the Christians care a lot about this particular village. Yeah, exactly. You think through excavations like this, you've actually found the place of the nativity. I do believe that uh, this is the site uh, of the nativity. If Oshri is right, how did Matthew and Luke, writing a few decades after Jesus' death, confuse the Bethlehems? How do you explain the fact that there seems to be a very old tradition in the other place and total silence on this place? I would suggest Christianity wanted to uh, turn uh, Jesus into a messiah. And according to the Old Testament, the Messiah should come from David's house. And David came from Bethlehem near Jerusalem. That is why Jesus had to come from that Bethlehem. The biblical prophets predicted that the Messiah will come from the family of King David, who hailed from Bethlehem of the south. Saying that Jesus was born there fulfills the prophecy and proves his messiahship. Was this all a bit of early religious spin? To help answer this, I'm meeting with Dr. John Kloppenberg, professor of religion at the University of Toronto. Let's start with uh, Jesus and uh, where he was born. I mean, of course, the tradition is it says Bethlehem, but there were two Bethlehems, as it turns out. Is it possible that Jesus' birthplace was kind of moved for ideological reasons, because to be born in the Galilee would not be where a Messiah should be born? When we have so little data, uh, almost anything is theoretically possible. But I would say that the prior question is, why would we think that he's born in Bethlehem at all? The basis for connecting Jesus' birth with Bethlehem is very slender. It appears only in Matthew's Gospel and in Luke's Gospel, which are written at the latest stratum of, uh, of Christian tradition. The earlier levels of the Gospel traditions connect him with Nazareth. I mean, he's known as Jesus of Nazareth or Jesus the Nazarene. The Gospel of John, interestingly, has someone say, uh, he can't be the Messiah because we all know that the Messiah is the son of David and the Messiah comes from Bethlehem. The implication being that everybody knows that Jesus doesn't come from Bethlehem. And uh, both Matthew and Luke, when they talk about Bethlehem as the, the birthplace of Jesus, they're interested in connecting Jesus with David. And Bethlehem is David's town. So you're saying it could be that he was given a birthplace in the right town after the fact? That's right. Once Christians say that he's the Messiah, if he's a Davidic Messiah, then surely the Davidic Messiah must have been born in Bethlehem. Then you have to create stories that explain the birth in Bethlehem. According to Dr. Kloppenberg, not only is Bethlehem in question, but the entire nativity story as well. The only thing that everyone seems to agree on is that Jesus grew up in Nazareth. But there's nothing left there to excavate. However, just four miles away is the spectacular ancient city of Sephoris. Here, I hope to find some clues about the lost years of Jesus. Tradition portrays Jesus as a humble country boy growing up in the sleepy town of Nazareth. But excavations in the nearby city are forcing scholars to rethink this old quaint notion. 
Once known as the Jewel of the Galilee, this Roman city, Sephorus, continues to dazzle visitors with the ruins of an opulent marketplace, lavish theater, and beautiful mosaics. Wow, this is amazing. She is beautiful, isn't she? Since it was only four miles from his front door, wouldn't the young Jesus have been influenced by Sephorus? To understand more, I met up with David Goran, historian and tour guide. This is a huge site. Eh? It's a huge site, and it was uh, amazing that it mostly was unknown until 1984. So where are we going? To the theater, of course. It's showtime. It's showtime. Wow, this is impressive. Let me try the acoustics. OK, you stay here. Chiseled into bedrock, this theater can seat 4,000. On the stage, stage. Can you hear me? I can hear you, fine. The acoustics are pretty good. This is the hallmark of Hellenistic culture, theater, acting. Jesus lived very closely here. How far is Nazareth from here? Around four miles. Four miles. There's no way that a carpenter's son could have lived four miles from here and not come into touch with this place, right? There's no way that if you lived in the Galilee, you wouldn't meet Roman culture. One piece of compelling evidence that Jesus visited Sephorus isn't supplied by archaeology, but by the Bible itself. Scholars have wondered where Jesus picked up the word hypocrite, a Greek word meaning actor, and a word that Jesus used 24 times in the Gospels. There's a good chance that Jesus learned this word from plays performed in Greek here at Sephorus. Now look at the Gospels. Jesus is born in Bethlehem. He grows up in Nazareth, and Sephorus is never, ever mentioned. This was the center of Roman culture. And I bet you Jesus didn't have very many good things to say about Roman culture. So when the new religion, Christianity, was being sold to the Romans, suddenly every reference to Sephorus is edited out. Was this the work of ancient editors, or was Sephorus just not important enough to make it into the good book? I asked Dr. Klopfenberg for his opinion. Why do you think Sephora is such a big city, right in Jesus' backyard, is not mentioned? You would sort of expect an important city to be mentioned, and the fact that it's not is a bit of a puzzle. Perhaps even more puzzling that Sephorus is so close to Nazareth, and I would suppose that it would have been a place that Jesus visited and perhaps a place that both Jesus and his father worked in. That's where all the, the work was? Yes, exactly. So why do you think it's not mentioned? I don't have any answer for why it's not mentioned. Um, it may not have been mentioned because it was a pro-Roman site. It's conceivable that there were, that I suppose that Jesus made anti-Roman statements and those have been edited out. But we don't really have any, any strong evidence of that. So explaining silences is always a very difficult thing for historians. With no written evidence, all we can do is piece together a picture based on the archaeology. David takes me to the remains of an ancient home where the Roman and Greek influences can be seen and the mosaics left behind. The section of Sephorus has never been seen by the public. You have to pick up everything. What? It's there for a reason, no? It's the archaeologist in me. I have to just peek. Oh, look at that. Unveiled for the first time. Quite beautiful, actually. They're it playing. looks like they're playing a game. Yeah. They're playing dice, gambling. Mm -hmm. This place, religiously speaking, it's a den of sin. They're playing dice, games of chance. They got two guys dancing there. He's drinking and getting drunk. Jesus wouldn't have wanted to eat here. He wouldn't have trusted that the food is kosher enough, and these pictures would have offended him. This city of wealth and earthly delights provides a stark contrast to the farming village of Nazareth. Sephorus, with its pagan culture and decadent lifestyle, represents many of the things that Jesus would later preach against. It seems obvious to me that Jesus was influenced by the city. I'm heading back to Bethlehem of the Galilee, where Professor Ashri claims he has one final clue for his alternative nativity location. I'm back with Professor Oshri at the other Bethlehem in Galilee. It was here just 12 years ago that he uncovered the remains of a massive Byzantine church. 
We're on our way to check out where the church once stood and where Ashri believes that Jesus was really born. It wasn't a church under the highway. There was a church over the highway. Yes, exactly. Right? Right over here. Look, these guys are upset with us. Don't blame us. You're in a church. You're driving in the middle of a church. Really? This is a very different kind of church than I've ever been in before. <laughs> so this, this side road over there, that's where it started. And how far did it go? Uh, up to the oak tree. That's a big church. That's a big point in your favor. Why would somebody build in the middle of a little village in the Galilee a huge church like that, surrounded by a huge wall? Exactly. Now, where, where you mentioned there was a natural cave somewhere? Yeah, just uh, yeah, behind the, the oak tree. I've seen it in the early 90s, and it disappeared afterwards. Where? Somewhere here. What do you mean it disappeared? It was covered with the dirt, with soil. You say that behind this oak tree, you saw a natural cave. Yeah. So there's an entire church built around this natural cave. If you're right, mm -hmm. this is where in Byzantine time, they probably believed that the cave was the place where Jesus was born. Wouldn't it be quite easy to figure out if there's a cave there by just digging in the earth? Yeah, there's no problem in doing it. You just need the finance. But watch out, we are <laughs> breaking the law now. We're breaking the law, why? because we are not allowed to excavate without the permission. But look, look what we found here. You could see the top of the thing, where the dirt is. I mean, you could see that this is filled in. Mm -hmm. Are you going to give me a footnote that I rediscovered <laughs> the, the, the scene of the nativity? Yeah. yeah. <laughs> Archaeology in action. Could it be is? that behind this muddy wall is right. the actual birthplace of Jesus? I wonder if the people living above here know about any of this. Now, is that house sitting on top of the cave of the nativity, according to your theory? If I'm right. I, I want to meet these people. I'd like to meet these people. He's embarrassed. He's too embarrassed to come. Do you think they speak English? Hello? It's open. It's open. Hello? Hello. I just want to ask you some questions about. And there's the, the archaeologist. <laughs> what? You should warn me first. <laughs> yeah. I see your bags are packed over here. W when are you due? Storage. Do? Any day? Any day. Really? Did you realize that you have a backyard archaeological place? Yes. Yeah. There was a, a Byzantic uh, church here. We might be raising the value of your property a lot. Do you know that? No. How? Yeah. But why don't you tell her your theory? Why don't you tell her seriously? <laughs> I'm suggesting that Jesus was born here rather than uh, the Bethlehem near Jerusalem. Are you going to do a home birth? No. No? Because if you do a home birth, and if this is the place where Jesus was born, your kid can be born where Jesus was born. Wow. OK, this is good. This is archaeology in action. If I had doubts about Ashri's theory before, finding a pregnant woman above this possible nativity site is definitely a sign in his favor. Jesus is lost years and around age 30 when he's baptized by John and his ministry begins. I've retraced the footsteps of Jesus from Bethlehem to Nazareth. I've touched the very spot where Christian tradition says he was born. I've walked around his hometown and seen firsthand what it was like where he grew up. At Sephoris, I've seen the powerful influences that helped shape Jesus' philosophy. I've heard some new theories and made up some of my own. Most of the early life of Jesus remains a mystery, but now, for the first time, archaeology is providing a clearer picture of the formative years of the man at the heart of Christianity.